Um, hi, my name is Catherine Owens. Um, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about my work. Thank you so much uh, for being here. I appreciate it. And I really am grateful to the Wallingford uh, Library for inviting me to, to talk tonight. Let me get my slides. There we go. Um, so I think it's really important to, to just talk about the fact that I define myself as an interdisciplinary scholar. In, in academia where I work, people really like to divide you into you're a scientist or you're an artist. Um, but my background is, is varied. My first college degree was in studio art. And then I went on to, to get undergraduate degrees in anthropology and biology and then a master's in environmental studies and a PhD in sustainability and governance. And so I really think like interdis an interdisciplinary approach is important and, I, and it defines who I am as a scholar and a researcher. So for the past 20 years, I've focused on policy around water and wetlands. <clears throat> and in the last decade or so, most of that has focused on plastic pollution in Connecticut and around the world. And to me, the problem of plastic pollution is really the problem of single use plastic. You probably know because you're here. <laughs> you probably know that um, in the 1950s, uh, globally, we weren't producing that much, uh, relatively about 5 million tons of plastic each year. But by the late 20 teens and early 2020s, that was upward of 350 million tons every year. And you can read the documentation and sort of the prospectus of, of the plastics industry online. And they state very clearly that their goal is to increase the plastic that they are producing every single year. They see this as a growth industry. And it becomes a problem because most of that 368 million tons of plastic that are produced each year are not in use within 12 months of being manufactured. And you know, so they're designed to be used for a moment and then thrown away. And because of that, about 8 million metric tons of plastic enter the ocean every year, which is where my work began on the issue of plastic. We know that 95% of plastic packaging globally is not recycled, and 90.5% of all plastic ever made has never been recycled. So this idea of like, well, we'll just fix it by recycling it is kind of a, a, a marketing <laughs> ploy, you know, more than anything else. A lot of debris is removed from the ocean and from coastlines every year. In South Korea, just in 2012, 42,000 tons were collected. Um, you may be familiar with the Ocean Conservancy, which holds an annual cleanup event. I think the Connecticut River Conservancy's event that happens every fall, the Source to Sea cleanup is connected with that as a part of that, if you've ever participated in that. So for example, in 2009, over 100 countries, uh, people in over 100 countries were cleaning up uh, their local area and collected over 6.8 million pounds of trash just in that year for the Ocean Conservancy's annual cleanup. But what's wild about that is that it's not that the, the next year in South Korea, there was no debris or the next year in the locations of the Coastal Conservancy, I'm sorry, the Ocean Conservancy's cleanup that there weren't, there weren't any debris. In fact, every year when they go back, there's just more and more. And plastic is a problem for several reasons. Um, it doesn't break down quickly. It harms wildlife, which is a big part of the project that I'm working on. You'll hear a lot about that tonight. It also worsens the issue of invasive species. It creates a toxic soup in our oceans as it breaks down. It costs a lot of money to clean it up. And that's money that's borne by the taxpayers and not sort of the people who produce it. And then it also exacerbates the problems of climate change. So we know it doesn't break down quickly. That's part of what makes it so useful as a material, right? People who study our trash um, tell us that only about 10% of what we throw away is plastic, um, but it shows up in the environment in a much higher proportion. And when you see the results of the cleanups that I've done here in Connecticut and in India, you'll notice that it's much higher than 10%. And the plastic that is out there um, can take, you know, depending on the type of plastic, whether it's a thin film or a hard plastic bottle, and depending on the conditions it in, is in, 
it could take from dozens to hundreds of years to break down. So if it's on a coastline, it's being exposed to sunlight and wind and wave action and combination of water and oxygen, it's gonna break down more quickly than if it's on the bottom of the ocean floor. <clears throat> Plastic is a problem because of the harm it, it causes wildlife. And that happens through ingestion and entanglement and then also um, as it degrades in ecosystems that are critical for wildlife. So I have a few slides. The next few slides have um, images of animals that have been harmed by plastic pollution. So they're, they're not easy to look at. And I just want you to be warned. There are going to be about four slides like that. And then um, after that, um, there won't be any more slides showing um, harm to animals. This is a photograph by the artist Christopher Jordan of the lace and albatross. Um, <clears throat> the lace and albatross are kind of the poster species for the issue of ingestion. They nest on the Midway Islands, which are relatively near the one of these patches where debris accumulates, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And what happens is adult birds um, have they nest on the Midway Islands. They set up their nests. They have their they're young, they're hatchlings, and they go off to find food for them and to bring it back. <clears throat> and in the past, you know, they would bring back things that they saw on the surface that were glinting in the sunlight, you know, that kind of thing that were bobbing in the surface. Um, increasingly now what they're bringing back are pieces of plastic. And so what happens is the birds, the young birds stomachs fill with that plastic so much so that they cannot take in enough calories to grow and thrive and fledge. And so instead, um, many of them die um, before ever um, leaving the nest and sort of like um, moving on to the next phase of their lives. But it's not just something that happens to birds in the middle of the Pacific on an island. This is, uh, there was a recent article in Beef Magazine, which I do not subscribe to, um, though it sounds really interesting. Um, I just came across it um, in a search, <clears throat> but, and I did not realize that cattle have something that they call hardware disease. And that is when a cow might be grazing in a field and they might come across something like a piece of metal, like a nut or a bolt or something like that. And they're not able to distinguish it and they might ingest some of it. And what, um, ranchers are finding now increasingly is a version of what they call hardware disease called plastic disease, where they're eating the plastic that they um, find in their local communities. Um, there's gonna be a rough photo next, just, um, just be warned. This is a photograph of the Northern Gannet from the Helgeland in Germany. And you can see this is the other, the other issue that happens with these animals, it's entanglement, um, where they get wrapped up or caught in debris and it um, can cause them a lot of harm. This is a photo that was shared with me by Helen Masters of the Phillips Island Nature Park in Victoria, Australia of an Australian fur seal. And this is a clinic where animals come in that they help out um, try to rehabilitate. And in this case, this Australian fur seal was brought in and they thought at first that maybe it had been hit by a boat propeller, this gash in its neck they thought might've been caused by that. Um, but as they were working on the animal, what they found is uh, actually at the bottom of the wound, this small cord or string, which you can see with the ruler there is not very large. It's not very thick. It's not very heavy, but it, it caused injuries to this animal that it was not able to survive. They taxidermied the remains to use it as a teaching tool in their um, clinic. What we know about entanglement and ingestion uh, with different species comes first from an article in 1997. So over 20 years ago, someone first reported and cataloged all the different species that were affected by this, a researcher named David Laced. And at that time, there were records of over 250 different species that were affected. And this is going to um, contribute to my project later. You'll hear more about it. Um, in 2015, Kuhn et al. did an update of that research, <clears throat> and they found that the number had more than doubled. A couple of things are happening there. Yes, there's more plastic in the ocean between 1997 and 2015, but it's also that this became an issue that people are researching during that time period. So at first, da David Lace is recording really anecdotal evidence, and by 2015, people are going out and looking for um, cases of entanglement and ingestion. 
Um, plastic is always also a problem because of the way it worsens the issues of invasive species. So if you can imagine um, an, some sort of creature uh, uh, hitchhiking from one island chain to another on a piece of driftwood, it can go even further on a piece of plastic. And a lot of what happens with this, this movement of species between island chains or land masses is not really about large animals moving from one place to another. Um, a lot of the harm can be from really small microscopic um, organisms. But if you know anything about invasive species or non-native species, you know that they can cause a lot of problems in new ecosystems and cost a lot of money to try to uh, repair or fix. Plastic also creates a toxic soup in our oceans. People have heard that the Pacific garbage patches or the other garbage patches are these sort of floating islands of trash, but it's more accurate to say that they're more like a churning soup of debris that's slowly being broken down. And what researchers who study the Pacific garbage patch can tell us is that the number of pieces of debris is incre increasing and the size of those pieces is decreasing, just like you would expect if you put a bunch of plastic in your washing machine and it was just being turned around. And so because of that, we have, um, you know, we've learned about microplastics and nanoplastics, these smaller and smaller particles uh, that are in the environment. And it's not just an environmental problem, it's an economic problem. Um, the problem of plastic and marine debris costs a lot of money, particularly to the industries of tourism and recreation, shipping, yachting, uh, for fisheries and aquaculture, and also for agriculture. One study of 31 beaches in Orange County, California, found that, that if they could reduce marine debris by 50% at their beaches, they could generate 67 million additional dollars um, in benefits to local residents over a three month period. Uh, we're not that far from the beach. People love to go to the beach and they don't just want to go there and sit, right? They go, they use gas money to get there. They stay at hotels, they rent sports equipment, they eat at restaurants and, and drink at bars. And all of that generates a lot of money, but people like to go to beaches that they perceive to be clean. This is a, a beach um, uh, that I visited in, in India. Uh, so it's not just important in Connecticut, you know, some, for some places around the world, Tourism is their biggest industry, and it's critically important to, to the local communities um, that that industry is protected. Um, one researcher um, looked at the cost of damage um, caused by marine litter at the, within the 21 Pacific Rim economies and found that it was the equivalent of 1 billion US dollars each year. A lot of that was to the shipping industry, actually, right? Shockingly large amount of money. In the UK, removing marine litter costs ports and harbors about 2.7 million US dollars per year. And that's different from the money that UK municipalities spend uh, each year to clean their beaches, which is about 20 million US dollars per year. So this is big, big money. It's also important um, to the issue of climate change. Plastics worsen, worsen the issue of climate change at every stage of their um, production through extraction and transport, refining and manufacturing, waste management, and in the environment. So as an example, in extraction and transport in the US in 2015, the emissions from fossil fuels, which is primarily from fracked gas extraction and production that was attributed to plastic production was about 9.5 to 10.5 million metric tons of CO2 equivalents. So a lot of the fracking that's happening in the United States is not happening to heat our homes. <laughs> it's not to fuel cars, right? It is to produce single use plastics. In terms of refining and manufacturing, plastic refining is among the most greenhouse gas intensive industries in the manufacturing sector. And it's one of the fastest growing. When considering waste management, Several different things can happen to plastic at the end of its life. It can be landfilled, recycled, or incinerated. Each of these produces additional emissions with, at varying levels. Um, recycling is better than the other two, but it's also a very um, energy and uh, water intensive process. And as you heard from the beginning of the slideshow, it's not happening to most of the plastics anyway. 
in the environment, plastic continues to break down and plastic on the ocean surface, surface continues to release methane and other greenhouse gases, um, which it's sort of like as they continue to break down, it, it happens at a, at a higher rate. When it's on coastlines and riverbanks and in the landscape, um, it, it increases um, uh, with the emissions that it's producing as it breaks down. So I don't want people to get depressed. <laughs> I always tell my students, please don't get depressed. Not quite yet. Um, because I believe we can solve the problem of plastic. And I'm not alone. Many researchers who've studied this for decades believe that this is a problem that can be solved. And what the research, uh, some of the research indicates is that to do so, we need to tackle the root causes. Uh, we need to take local context into account plastic debris and marine debris can look very different in different communities. We need to consider human behavior and how that affects uh, the whole cycle. We need to perform education and outreach and to create um, strong policy. So with all that in mind, after reading those, those articles, I applied for a grant uh, from NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in 2016. And the idea is that I would take my, my UHART students who are policy students, and I would teach them scientific methods to collect debris. People do collections all around the world um, frequently, um, but they're not always treating it like a, a scientific data collection. And with a few tweaks, you can go and do a collection and actually collect um, data that scientists can use to better understand the problem. So the idea is that we would, we would use those methods, we would collect debris, we would analyze it, and then we would present the results to politicians. I really wanted to use that scientific information to help our local state legislators better understand the problem. We eventually made our way to Meg's Point and Hammonasset, which because of that rocky coastline, actually a lot of debris collects in the sort of spaces between there. And this is some of the debris we found. Um, in a few hours, we found over 1600 pieces of debris and about 75% of it was plastic. If you recall from the beginning, I said uh, that about 10% of what we throw away is plastic, but it shows up in the environment at higher rates. This helps illustrate that. And then we, we sorted it, we cataloged it, we weighed it, we measured it in every conceivable way to try to understand its source. And what we found was that it was, for the most part, what I would describe as municipal waste. It was cigarette butts, plastic water bottles, food wrappers, <laughs> flip-flops, toys, the kind of things that we see every day, people, people touch every day. So we were able to share the results with the, at the time, co-chair of the environmental committee of the Connecticut General Assembly. Did that lead to policy change? You may be asking yourself. And the answer is no, it did not, <laughs> not in any way. Um, uh, I teach uh, policy and policy change, environmental policy. And so I think it was a really valuable lesson for my students that you don't necessarily just show up with one year's worth of research and get everything you want um, from policymakers. Uh, policy is a really incremental, slow moving process. If you're someone who looks at the state um, policymaking process or follows it or advocates for things, you'll, you'll know that. Since this time in, in 2016, there have been some changes in policy uh, in Connecticut, uh, we had the plastic bag. Uh, they don't call it a tax, but many of us call it a tax, um, <clears throat> which was somewhat successful, but it and a lot of policies uh, globally uh, got rolled back during COVID. <clears throat> so based on that work, I decided to apply uh, for a grant to sort of take my project on the road. And the, the research, the, the scientific literature often points to South Asia and Southeast Asia as being sort of um, places where plastic pollution is at its worst. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more um, in a bit. But having, having read that research, I decided to apply to a Fulbright grant to go to the University of Kerala um, and take my family there in 2019 for six months to do some work. We were, this is Kerala, if you're not familiar with uh, the states of India, it's in the very far Southwest. And we were in uh, this town, which is right under the red star called Thiruvananthapuram. 
And I, I wasn't just sort of, I think it's really important to not just sort of like show up as an American there to solve the problems of the world, right? I had read research where Indian researchers were saying, this is a problem that's not well studied in India. Um, they use uh, many of the same methods um, that I use and they were sort of calling for um, more assessment and monitoring in India. So I felt comfortable reaching out to Indian researchers and asking them if they'd like to collaborate on this project. And the idea behind the project is that we would replicate that NOAA um, work where I would teach and support students, we would collect and catalog debris and then share the results with policymakers. These are some of the um, students uh, in the middle and the top is my, my closest collaborator, Dr. Jaya, and you'll hear more about some of the other um, uh, groups in a bit. We did several collections um, while I was there working with the master students and PhD students at the University of Kerala. One of the first ones was at a local beach called Manamkulam um, in March of 2019, where in just a few hours, we found over 6,000 pieces of debris and 84% uh, of what we found was plastic. Just like in the United States, I would characterize it as municipal waste seeing the exact same kinds of things, cigarette butts, um, drinking bottles, um, plastic wrappers from foods. And working with Dr. Jaya, I applied to a grant uh, from the National Geographic Society. And the idea behind that grant is that we would invite researchers, uh, stakeholders, teachers from across India to the University of Kerala, and we would train them in the same methods so that they could go back to their home communities and replicate this project. And we got the funding and we were able to bring 33 researchers down to um, the University of Kerala uh, for a week long workshop, which was amazing. We did a collection on the Karamana River, which is a freshwater you know, river right there. Uh, and at that river, we found over 1600 pieces of debris, 80% of what we found was plastic. And then we went back to Manamkulam Beach, which we'd just been to in March, this was in June. And again, we found over 6,000 individual pieces of debris. 88% of what we found was plastic. And these are some shots from the workshop where we were sorting through all that stuff. Um, just like in the US and in the previous collection in, in India, uh, we found that it was for the most part uh, municipal waste. And um, working with that group, we were able to uh, publish an article uh, based on our findings. Of the 33 participants in the workshop, not all of them, but many of them went back to their home communities and replicated the project, uh, leading to the cleanup of over 33,000 individual pieces of debris. Um, plastic was always the most frequently found item but that ranged depending on the site from uh, being 45% of the sample to um, more like 89 to 90% of the sample. So based on that work, I, I applied to a grant with uh, other National Geographic um, explorers, Hannington Ocheng from Uganda, he's a river ecologist, and Puspit Kamil from Indonesia, who's a social scientist. And we wanted to replicate this project on the Aturukuku River near Tororo, Uganda. I think I'm saying all that right, because I never got to go to Uganda because we were planning this for 2020 um, in the summer and it never happened. But um, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. I returned from India, it's the fall of 2019, step with me back in time for a moment. I was working on like with colleagues on campus from other colleges to create uh, courses about plastic pollution and marine debris. I was working with my, my friends from India to plan more research there. I had worked with Puspita and Hannington to create this other grant uh, for National Geographic and we got funded. I was like publishing and speaking and communicating about the projects. And I really thought 2020 was gonna be my year. And guess what happened? <laughs> Everybody knows what happened um, next. And I don't have to explain to anyone how, how much the pandemic derailed everything we had planned um, for 2019 or 2020 or 2021. So all of the international research got, got canceled. I was about to go to Colombia to lead a workshop in March of, of 2020. Definitely the Uganda project got canceled. Um, uh, developing programs with India have been canceled. 
And not only that, but my everyday job changed a great deal. Um, <clears throat> I run an interdisciplinary department at my university where we have about 120 classes each semester. And so all of a sudden I went from sort of like getting to work on research to my whole world being taken over with trying to train people to, to go on Blackboard for the first time or to do remote teaching for the first time. And um, so it was very frustrating. And, um, and I don't have to explain how that felt. <laughs> Everybody knows how that felt. But it got me thinking a little bit about the way we talk about plastic pollution and the way in general that we communicate big ideas. So I have this background in the arts and I, as a visual learner, like the arts are really important to me and the way I understand things. But researchers also believe that the arts are a powerful tool um, in terms of uh, communicating social topics. Um, researchers have found that um, the arts can help create empathy for the natural environment. They can invert, engage diverse learners on a lot of different topics and diversity in a lot of different ways, sort of in uh, the ways many of us think about diversity, sort of like ethnicity or race, but also in education level and socioeconomic level in terms of age, um, <clears throat> that the arts are just more approachable for a lot of people and certainly more approachable than like some of the scientific articles you know I've written or co-written but many researchers believe that the arts are still underutilized as a way to communicate about the environment so I started thinking about the the story of marine pollution and I told you before that researchers have said uh, that South Asia and Southeast Asia are sort of the worst places for this and you might be shocked if you read some of these articles there there is an article that says you know these are the 10 worst polluting countries, and they're overwhelmingly in South Asia or Southeast Asia. There's an article that says, you know, these are the most polluted rivers in the world, and they're overwhelmingly in South Asia and Southeast Asia. But what's interesting is, you know, I use plastic every day. I try to avoid it. I find it's unavoidable. Go into a CVS or to your local grocery store and try to find something that's not made of plastic or wrapped in plastic. It's incredibly difficult. But what happens to my trash, right, is that it, it gets in a, in a plastic bag, <laughs> it gets put in a plastic bin, it's taken down to the street, it's picked up by a truck, and I don't have to worry about it again. But in the best case scenario, it's going to be landfilled or incinerated, and that causes enormous problems for soil and air quality. But those are problems that happen in the future, right? And on the surface, it looks okay. So I think in the United States, we're actually not better at solving this problem. We're just better at hiding this problem. And having spent a small amount of time in South India, I don't think it's a fair or just characterization of the global problem when it's the global north that's selling to the global south, many times to people who, who have to buy things in small packets um, like shampoo uh, is sold um, in many places in India and in sort of like what we would think of as like a ketchup packet size, because that's all that people can afford. And so I think this sort of characterization is, is not um, true or honest. And so I started thinking about um, some pieces that I'd done from before I went to India. I had all this plastic, I was saving it, trying to figure out how to recycle, recycle it. And so I started to make these sort of like portraits of different marine species out of plastic pollution. But I mean, some of them were more successful than others, um, uh, but they weren't really telling like any kind of a cohesive story. It was just something I was doing. But during uh, the pandemic, I started thinking about how I could use this method in particular as a way to tell a better, more complete sort of holistic story about the way plastic moves through the earth. And so I started thinking about this article by David Laced where he named in 1996, these 250 plus species that were harmed by plastic pollution. And 250 seemed like a bit much, but within that list was a smaller list of 46 animals for which at that time we had records of both entanglement and ingestion. So more than 20 years ago, we knew that these 46 species were getting harmed a lot um, by plastic in the environment. Those are the names of those species. And these are the ones in gray or the ones I've, it's kind of bluish gray on there, the ones I've finished. I don't know if you can distinguish the ones I have and haven't finished, but of the 46, I have about seven left. 
<clears throat> and to make it interesting, and because I'm a visual learner, I'm doing them all to scale. So some of them are cute little, you know, penguins and puffins. And the two largest on my list are the 60 foot sperm whale and the 50 foot um, bowhead whale. And my process is just to sort of get the canvas and sketch on it um, and sketch on it these portraits of, of the animals. Let's see. Yeah. And then I use the plastic and I hand sew um, the, the animal's portraits. That's the fairy penguin. You can see the sizes for each one. Um, the winter flounder, that's the greater shearwater. The Atlantic cod, green sea turtle. Leech's storm petrel, and you might see brands or things that you recognize. <laughs> when I take this to elementary schools, they're like, oh, you have a cat? <laughs> yes, I do have a cat. Uh, laughing gull, this is the laughing gull. The Atlantic puffin. The dusky shark. The black tip shark. That's the white-faced storm petrel. Kemp's Ridley sea turtle, the stellar sea lion, sooty tern, the Atlantic herring, short-tailed shearwater, the tufted puffin, the sooty shearwater, northern fulmar. You can see a lot of seabirds are affected the loggerhead turtle, the harbor porpoise, the guillemot, uh, common tern, black-legged kittiwaki, the lace and albatross. Remember the lace and albatross from that earlier photograph, one of the best known species I think that's affected by um, ingestion. The Western Gull, the Horned Puffin. Sadly, several puffins are on the list. I think four or five. The Sand Tiger Shark, the Antarctic Scow. Not sure if I'm saying that right. Herring Gull, Tiger Shark. And for any of the pieces that are over 20 feet, I decided to make them a public art project, which many of you know because you participated in sewing one tonight. So last summer, when, when things were finally opening up a little bit again, I was able to take the minky whale around to camps in Hartford and West Hartford and Middletown and got a lot of kids to participate in helping sew it, which was fantastic. I'm at a, a, a camp for teens. So that's the minky whale finish. So it's 18 feet by seven feet um, when it's complete. And then I started in the winter on the sperm whale, which is 60 feet by 20 feet. This is at my um, uh, neighborhood elementary school, McDonough School in, Mc, in Middletown. And then they allowed me to use an empty storefront in Middletown, which is a godsend because where, where are you going to put a 60 foot whale otherwise? And um, it's an empty storefront, had a lot of space, a great space. And so I was able to allow the public to come in and work on the sperm whale from December through April. You can see some different photos of people working on it. You can see it kind of coming together. Those are each like six foot wide rolls of canvas. And just for scale, you can see the minky whale behind it. There, it's really coming together. This, you can see it, that's me lying on the ground yeah. next to it. I have a friend with a drone, thank goodness. Um, he helps me take the pictures of any of these, these big ones. I don't know how I do it otherwise. And then uh, we're working on the bowhead whale, which is about 53 feet 
long. This was at a snow school in McDonough, I'm sorry, in Middletown. Uh, and we're not, that one's not completed yet. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm trying to just continue this work to try to connect up science and policy and the arts. I think it's a really valuable way uh, to communicate big ideas. And I, and I think it can reach a completely different audience than, than I would normally reach by going to scientific uh, conferences or publishing in scientific journals. Um, so it's, it's a, I'm enjoying myself. <laughs> um, I'm continuing collaborating with my um, colleagues uh, from India. Uh, the Ugandan project, uh, we decided instead of going to the to the river in Uganda for each of us to work on a workshop in our own uh, backyard, so to speak. So I held a workshop in Middletown in the spring, training people to collect debris and share the results with policymakers. And right now I'm working to get funding um, to do the next stage of Entangled and Ingested. These were 46 portraits. I should be done uh, by the end of summer. <clears throat> if you remember, there was an article after the latest article that had over 500 species. So I've already cross-listed that and, and checked it out. And if I do all of those animals that were so, that are we have records for both entanglement and ingestion that will be an additional 73 portraits and there's a bunch of whales on the list like 12 12 whales on the list so i think i have my work cut out for me for the next decade if i want to if i want to keep working on this um and and that's it yeah i'm happy to answer any questions you might have Oh, that's a big question. Well, the sperm whale is like, it's on canvas, so it's rolled up and it's in, um, in my house. The bowhead whale is in the back of my car right now. Um, but I'm trying to find a place to display them. But it just, if I want, my dream is to see all 46 of them together at one point. I don't sell them or anything. Um, so, but I don't know what that place is. It's going to be a very large place. Displays of like I need someone to pick me to do that, to sink their money into. Um, <laughs> I, I have worked with the Mystic Aquarium. The thing about aquariums is that all the walls are tanks. So they don't have, unless they have like a museum uh, or have a partnership or, or gallery, they don't have as much space. Um, because I'm a National Geographic Explorer, um, I was able to talk with their director. They have a museum in DC. I was able to talk with their director and she's trying to help me through the process of creating like a traveling show. But I don't think it would be all of them because how many venues would be able to have two, you know, 50 and 60 foot whales. So it might be sort of traveling shows that are a subset of the pieces. If you have an airplane hanger that needs that needs art, please reach out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have. Um, I I've been on the news a couple of times and I had an article in the Hartford Current and then the Meriden Record Journal and Middletown, of course, like the Middletown Press has covered it. Um, but I think. Um, that would help too, in terms of like uh, getting it to a, you know, getting it to display it somewhere. And I've been applying to grants and um, different museums or art spaces will have like sort of annual calls where they're trying to get people for the next year's shows. I've applied for some of those as well. So is the work to clean up the river making a difference? when we go and clean up beaches, we sort of send the message, like you can keep producing this material that's polluting and we'll just keep coming to clean it up. Uh, so, um, I mean, I do it, I do it frequently and, and have picked up like tens of thousands of pieces of debris in the last um, decade and I still train my students on it. But I, um, it's sort of like a, a great analogy that I've heard is, you know, if you if you walked into your bathroom and you saw the tub overflowing, what would you do first? Would you get a towel and start mopping it up off the floor or would you turn off the tap? 
And uh, usually the answer is turn off the tap. And I think, you know, a lot of what we're doing with beach cleanups um, or trying to promote like very small scale recycling programs are not getting at the problem, which is the production of more than 350 million tons of plastic each year, much of it uh, single use plastics. So I think we have to get that. And where is that I mean, uh, there, well, we've had for uh, two sessions of Congress, um, the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act, um, <clears throat> but it's a really hard time <laughs> to move things through Congress. And I think, you know, it's competing with a lot of really, really big issues right now. Um, so I've been trying to spread the word on the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act for a couple of years. But I think more public awareness could help with that. Um, I think some people are trying to hold the plastics industry accountable, but it's a, it's a real uphill battle. Um, I did a, a study. Um, there's several, some of the biggest plastic producers in the world have all chipped in and started a nonprofit where they spend, it sounds like a lot of money. I, I can't even think of the number. It might be a billion dollars a year to, to make the reality of plastic I can't remember how they phrase it, but it's very carefully phrased um, <laughs> to, to stop plastic waste in the environment. Um, but the amount of money they're putting forward is less than 1% of their net profits per year. And so I think we just need more people um, uh, demanding change. I think it's really um, effective to both reach out to your legislators at every level, um, you know, local, state, national, but also to tell the people who make things that you don't want it wrapped in plastic because we're we're in America, right? And the dollar makes a difference. And and I think some companies are uh, very tuned into that. Right. Absolutely, it's all it's all deeply connected, and um, that is the growth sector of the petrochemical industry. Like I said, like that fracking that's happening in the United States is not to heat homes; it's to produce single-use plastics. So that's really what they see as their next um, big growth area. Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> yes, I mean, part of it too is that the logos are on the colorful side in many cases. But yeah, I had um, folks at National Geographic ask if they could include my work in their um, in their kids magazine. And then the legal department was like, I don't know if we can use it because of all the logos. And I still don't know what they're going to decide. Actually, I think we're going to go with this one because you can't really see the logos. Um, but um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's really important and not, I mean, I, I don't think like the, the person who decides on packaging from Purina is necessarily going to see my work, but I think it helps the user connect with things they're, they're buying and not even thinking about. Um, I went, I did one presentation and someone was like, oh, halo, uh, mandarins. I, <laughs> do I have to feel bad about those? I thought I was doing something good for myself. Um, but I think just sort of recognizing how it's all around us and, and how it's in so many products that we use is important. Do you have questions from the chat? <laughs> Should I look at the chat? I can't see it. No, you're good. You're good. You're good. Okay. Can you look for community groups to go out and help you clean the efforts? Um, a lot of the cleanups I do are with students or with people I'm training, just because of uh, because of time. You know that I I have to um, focus and and so I end up mostly doing it with my students. But there are a lot of organizations in Connecticut that do frequent cleanups. Um, uh, the Connecticut River Conservancy has the big one every year, the Source to Sea cleanup, and, and I think a lot of other groups are doing it too. The lawns on the company, plastic companies are pretty large. 
with the lay friends. There. <laughs> <laughs> and that would call a lot of attention to us. Yeah. We shared it with some local authority. But um, you know, I think I think what is we said, you know, don't get depressed, but I think I feel like for like for my entire adult life, I tried to make all you know choices, you know, pick for a diaper, I mean no pick for diapers, mm -hmm. you know. This and that recycle, mm -hmm. and then you find things aren't getting recycled like they should. Mm -hmm. And then um, choosing, like, I don't do, I don't like plastic water bottles, I don't use them. Mm -hmm. And then to see that everybody just buys them by the cases for for a while. Yeah. It's not even good for water like that. And so it's like you can't, like you said, you can't get away from it. Mm -hmm. we, but how much does each person making those kinds of choices have to kind of affect them? I mean, I do think it's kind of like voting, you know, people say like one vote doesn't matter, but you know, sometimes, sometimes locally it does. Um, but I think, you know, if, if 10 million people think that, right. And they all, and they're, and they're all young people, right. And they all decide not to vote, then it does make a difference. So, um, I, I'm always trying to encourage my students to try to make those changes. And I do think that it sort of like expands out and can, can make greater change. But yeah, I mean, it, we really are working against like enormous multinational companies. Um, and then in place, some places, there's a really great group called Common Seas that um, I wrote an article where we were, we were contrasting that plastic groups um, nonprofit with Common Seas because they um, do a lot of work that feels much more about like uh, reducing plastic at the at the tap instead of sort of like trying to clean it up later. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they're doing is, you know, okay, if in the developing world and places where there's a lot of tourism, you have to have clean water or people are just gonna keep drinking out of bottle, bottles of water. You know, there are places in the world where you, people do have to or get filtered, you know, find some way to filter water. So, I mean, there are groups that I think are trying to not just to like uh, put a bandaid on it, but trying to really like address um, uh, the, the causes, but it takes a while for those to, um, those ideas to get out. And it, it can be really frustrating. I mean, there are articles from the 1970s, late seventies, early eighties, where researchers are saying, wow, this is, I'm saying this a lot. <laughs> this is going to be a real problem if we don't do something about it. And I mean, I love scientists, but I think that's kind of one of the problems with science and science communication is that there's this group of people who have so much information and they're all kind of communicating with each other and not necessarily sharing it um, with the wider world. Uh, and I, and I think, um, I think many people are trying to do better, but I also think that's where the sort of capitalism comes in. Even if you're trying to do better, sometimes it's impossible. Um, there's just, unless you have unlimited time or money, how do you buy all of your food and not have it wrapped in plastic? I mean, I don't, I can't, I don't know how to do that. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you for making. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate yeah. it. <laughs> I just have one more comment. Mm -hmm. Art is a really good communicator. It just means to get things visual arts. You can do a lot of positive things. And I want to say on a positive note, I feel like when you really, people, when you really kind of put them to the test, I mean, everybody bumbled their first bumbles, every store I went to, oh, my God, look at that. <laughs> and I think people now like have turned it around because they had to just say, I actually didn't really need them. Right. I don't need them. Right. And I think that's what you have to take for me <laughs> and change that, like really show that you, you can do it without these things. Not everything. I can't get my shampoo without you know, plastic. It's very dangerous. I tried glass. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There is a company now that's doing like refillable metal containers loop. And I think they've expanded to, to more stores, but 
but it's true and it's sometimes like prohibitively expensive to get to get your shampoo that way but um i do think i just saw i'm on this like really nerdy like uh, marine debris listserv and all the chatter today was about um festivals and concerts and what people are doing now to make sure people aren't using like one you know one use cups at those things and someone was in california saying hey i'm trying to to have this big festival and we just need cups you know but we don't want glass and what can we do and like 13 people shared 13 different companies that are doing that around the world and so i think like it's actually like a, a huge it, different industry right um that um that i hope people take advantage of because there's a billion dollar you know industry all on its own like using alternatives and figuring out other systems All of our dinnerware is plants. They're made from the flip flop plastic. Uh huh. Along with a lot of other plastic. Clear containers and things like that. Wow. So it's just like, no. <laughs> they just like <laughs> melt. Um, well, so we, were, we were really careful about teaching kids what to do, but the kids don't get it. Yeah. But they push it and push it and push it. I should put you in contact. Yeah. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, I think there's a lot of good developments going on with that, with uh, like dinnerware, that kind of stuff too. Yeah. It's amazing. It looks like plastic. Yeah. Why couldn't we do that Right. There's, I've seen, I don't know if you've seen this like bubble that it looks like a bubble. It's made of algae. They use them in the London Marathon pre-pandemic um and and the and the, the bubble is edible i haven't seen one in real life but that someone's invented that and it and it's a considered a plastic alternative there's this company that's using fungi to basically create uh, something that's like a styrofoam that you could package a lot of things in so there's some really cool stuff going on there even um i was at a webinar recently where they were talking about uh, fast food containers and in some communities, they basically have a system where you you kind of like rent the fast food container, and so your food comes in that. You put a deposit on it, you can give it back. So, some really cool things going on. But the pandemic, like I said before, really knocked a lot of that stuff back, and also, I mean, exponentially increased you know the amount of um, single use plastics in terms of face masks and other things. Yeah, yeah. I see medical waste every time I walk. I, I um, want to publish an article about medical waste in the environment as um, a National Geographic named Justina Mindalia from Toronto. And I mean, she like, I mean, before the pandemic had really started, she had published an article about things she was seeing in her neighborhood. And then um, uh, she got together with researchers all over the world um, to so we each went last summer, went around our community. I think it was like a two kilometer um, route, the same route once a week for eight weeks. And I did uh, data collection in Middletown and I saw, I saw um, stuff every single time. So yeah, it's, and, and that, you know, if you think about like I do taking students to a beach or a riverside to do a collection, you know, you don't want, you don't want them touching medical waste in any, you know, <laughs> it's problematic for a lot of, a lot of reasons. And it, it's certainly not good for like the development of viruses and whatnot, but we're not going to be depressed about it, right? <laughs> there is hope. <laughs> right. There's plenty, plenty. Sure. What made you choose sewing as the mechanism for attaching the piece, or was that a choice, or instead of just gluing or something that might be faster? Than yeah, I mean, I like the process of hand sewing. I do. I was saying earlier um, when we were working on the shark across the hall, like when I'm when I was in Zoom meetings during the pandemic and kind of going crazy, I was like sewing, and it really helped me mental health wise um, during that time. I have tried to uh, glue, uh, like sort of Elmer's glue doesn't work very well. 
Um, I tried for a, a school that was trying to do it. I tried to do an example with the hot glue gun and that was a real disaster. As you could probably imagine it all melted and get, got weird. Um, but um, I, you know, I liked, I just like tactile engagement, you know, and so it, it just made sense to me. And people have asked me, why don't you just use a sewing machine, you know, but I, but I think it, it matters. I mean, for me, a lot of times, uh, what, I'm, what I like about the art I see is, is knowing that someone went to a lot of effort to do it. And, um, and so I like that process. I do it like when my family's watching TV at night or during meetings. So I, I get a lot done. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it.